The Gateway Trail Iron Bridge, embracing our engineering heritage. When bridges get built, they are built to stay in one place. They typically don't move. The Gateway Trail Iron Bridge, however, is an exception. It has been in three different spots in Minnesota and is currently providing a safe crossing for people using the Gateway Trail in Grant near Stillwater. This project has been going on for, I would say, at least five years. So why was this bridge so important that in order to preserve it, MnDOT has moved it twice? Yeah, and the state of Minnesota has maybe at the most, uh, we're aware of perhaps three historic iron trusses that are bridges made out of uh, wrought iron and some cast iron parts and uh, not made out of steel. Uh, before the 1890s, bridges were, metal bridges were all made out of wrought iron. After the 1890s, they're made out of steel. This bridge dates from the 1870s, so it's in the iron group and it's uh, pretty rare in the state of Minnesota. It's pretty rare nationally. Minnesota has a lot of bridges, but a relatively small number of historic bridges. When choosing which ones to save, the Gateway Trail Iron Bridge was a natural choice for preservation. It originally handled horse and buggy traffic across the Sauk River in Sauk Center. In 1937, the bridge was dismantled and moved to Highway 65 in Kuchiching County to bridge the Little Fork River. Modern traffic loads, especially logging trucks, were taking their toll on the bridge. While we often tried to avoid moving historic properties, leaving it in place meant that the bridge would not have had a very long life. So in order to ensure its continued use for years to come, it was decided to remove it from highway use and put it into less demanding trail use. This, this location is a very good spot for this bridge. We, we worked with the DNR who owns the trail um, and we had two historic bridges that we felt were best to get off the highway system. And so we asked the DNR, where do you have needs for, for bridges? Um, obviously the size of the bridge had to fit the size of the crossing so they looked across the state for different areas where they would need a bridge and so for this particular structure it was the right length, the right size for this crossing. To deliver this project required a lot of coordination between various offices within MnDOT. District 1 staff who were the owners of this bridge prior to building a new one in its place and they were involved with the dismantling and um, bringing the bridge down to the metro area to be stored until we could re-erect it here at this location. The metro district staff stepped up and helped deliver the project. Uh, the bridge office staff stepped in and um, oversaw the consultant's development of the bridge rehab plans. And the Cultural Resources Office, of course, had a strong role in making sure all this happened. Because this was the first bridge preservation project MnDOT undertook that involved moving a bridge, there were a lot of lessons to learn along the way. Finding a home for the bridge was the easy part. The Minnesota Department of Natural Resources wanted it and had a great place for it in Washington County. They would take ownership of it once it was installed. Lesson one, rivets. When restoring a historic property, the goal is to use the original construction techniques to ensure it still looks like it did when it was first built. For the Gateway Trail Iron Bridge, that meant putting it back together once we moved it using rivets. Trouble was, almost no one has installed rivets in the field since the 1960s. Our bridge engineers were concerned about having this type of work done, especially the handling and installing of the red hot rivets. As far as we know, this is the first time field riveting had been done in Minnesota in almost 50 years. And now that we have done it again, we're hoping to use it on future historic bridge restoration projects. Well, I think people had some concerns about how available people were to do the riveting, but uh, White Oak ended up riveting several components on the bridge, two floor beams, the portals, and then there were field riveters that did some bracing connections as well. Lesson two, horses. It's not exactly ironic that this 130-year-old bridge began with horse traffic and is now handling horses again on the Gateway Trail. It's more of a testimony to our engineering heritage preserved through the decades, that great projects stand the test of time and sometimes come full circle.
Nevertheless, the original bridge had a wood plank deck, but when we suggested going back to wood, we learned that horses, especially the ones ridden for exercise and leisure on the Gateway Trail, aren't very fond of walking on wood. They prefer concrete. So do the engineers, because of its durability and tendency to keep things deposited on the bridge deck from falling through to the highway below. Well, the, the concrete deck here is unique in that it's a lightweight concrete deck. So instead of weighing 150 pounds per cubic foot, it weighs 110 pounds per cubic foot. And what that means is we didn't need to strengthen some of the old truss members to carry the loads. They could stay much as they were back in the 1870s. The DNR also wanted a very high railing running the length of the bridge to prevent people from falling all the way off the bridge if a horse throws them. A tall railing didn't really fit into our vision of restoring the Gateway Trail Iron Bridge to its original design. More discussions, some tough negotiations, but we finally gave in to the horses. They got their concrete deck and high railing. However, we were able to adapt the 1937 highway railing to meet this current need by adding thin cable in between and above the original elements. From a distance, the cables disappear and the railing appears much as it did. There are, the railing for the new site here has elements from the bridge up at the Silverdale site. So these three rails came from the bridge in 1937. They were adjusted for current bicycle standards. And then the railing cables above the top rail were put in place for equestrian users of the trail. When we finally got to the night when the bridge was to be put in place, we quickly discovered we needed to add extra weights to the two cranes to place it on the ramps that the DNR had built for its new home over Manning Avenue. In many ways, those two cranes were metaphors for this whole project. There was a constant balancing act between two important priorities, preserving and restoring the bridge to its original form and making it useful and safe for everyday use by the public. And often, we needed help with some of the heavy lifting. A monument or a statue is a nice way to remember our history, but a working, practical, useful bridge that contains all the memories and sweat of those engineers and workers who put it together, not once, but three times, is a great accomplishment. It's a piece of living history. MnDOT wants to thank all the organizations that helped us save this bridge and restore it to its original purpose, including the Department of Natural Resources, Washington County, the State Historic Preservation Office, Meat and Hunt Historians, Olson and Nesvolt Engineers, and all the other stakeholders that helped make this happen.